How you doing, Richard? Name's Hickory. Welcome to the neighborhood, by the way. And this is this is where the magic happens. Right now, I got a little bit of chuck going on here, and I like to make sure the temperature of this bad boy gets to about 206, 207. Let's see. Perfect. I'll spend about 65% of my week standing around this thing. Low and slow is the name of the game, and my neighbors actually like to call me Billy Brisket because this is all I can talk about. My wife Mesquite and I love going to the HOA meetings and whenever they're talking about budget, I'll always pop the question, how much are we allocating for pork butt? And they'll kick me out after like 10 minutes, nine times out of 10. The amount of smoke this thing churns out, you'd think the fire department would be here 24 seven. I know all the guys down there. I said, if there's ever a false alarm, I'd make it worth their while and me. Everyone hates me for it, but Typically, I'll throw a few hunks of charcoal in the washing machine with the laundry, just so everyone at work knows that I'm an absolute pit boss. The amount of ribs I've thrown on that sucker feed the entire Roman Empire for a week straight. <laughs> well, good morning. Uh, I don't know if you know that person, but I do. Uh, we all know, I mean, probably, if you've met somebody who gets really passionate about uh, smoking meat, it becomes their whole identity. That is who they are. They cease to do anything. They're not a parent. They're not a spouse. They're not an employee. They just are a person who smokes meat. Like, maybe not to this extreme, but we have a guy on our staff. Um, he helps run our missions and outreach team. His name's Braden Crow. He's awesome. We love Bird Dog. But frequently on Saturday mornings at like sometime between 6 and 7 a.m., I will get a text from him with a picture of a pork butt on his smoker and nothing else. No context, nothing. Just a picture of a piece of meat on his smoker. And he talks about it all the time. He tells me how he's adjusting the smoke and what he's doing. I mean, like people that love to smoke meat just really love it and they won't shut up about it. It's not just them. Like we all have this tendency in us to get excited about something and just talk about it all the time. For example, have you ever met somebody who does CrossFit? <laughs> All right, so you, that answer is either yes, and they've told you about their gym, and they've told you their gym doesn't have AC, and they've told you that they flip tires at the gym, they've told you they can do 18 of those fake, not real pull-up things, they've told you all about their workout of the day, like they've told you everything about their workout that you don't care about anyway, you, yes, or you've never met anyone who does CrossFit, because there's no in-between. That is just everyone, they, I love dogging on CrossFit, it's fun. It's low hanging fruit, so it's pretty easy. But it's not just them. So, you ever met somebody who got a pedicure for the first time? They come back to you after getting a pedicure for the first time and they talk about it as if a miracle happened. It's not like a random person washed their feet for 30 minutes. It's like the son of God himself was the one washing their feet and your, their life was changed because of the fact that they got their feet washed by this person. When we get excited about something, we just can't shut up about it. We just won't stop talking about it. That person who starts DIYing at their house, that was my wife. She, it was, she was in first service. So I can make fun of her second service. She, she got real into, real into DIY for a while. And she's like, hey, Jeff, come here. Come here, come here. Let me show you this tool I found on TikTok. I'm like, woman, look at me. I don't care what that, no. She's like, this wall right here, we could tear it down because it's not load bearing, but that one is, so we can't. I like people that get into DIY, they get really, really into it. But the best, bar none, is essential oils. You people. It is, it is as if those were sent straight from heaven. Somebody, somebody gets a little cough and they're like, hey, just put a little bit of lavender on your wrists and you'll be fine. I'm like, that's a flower. I don't need to do that. Or they're like, he start feeling run down and they're like, no, eucalyptus under the tongue, better in seconds. The best is there's something, if you, all the, all the essential oilers are gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, there's something called thieves oil. And I don't, I can't even describe to you what it is. All I can tell you is it, the people that love essential oils feel like it has miraculous properties. You could just tell them, I've just had a rough day. I'm a little sleepy. My kids were fighting at home. They're like, you know what will help your kids stop fighting? Thieves oil, you'll be fine. Like it is people that get into essential oils just love to talk about essential oils. And that's all of us. And I'm not exempt from this. I mean, I do have a diffuser in my bedroom right now and it does smell great, just in all honesty. <laughs> But I've stood on this stage and told y'all, if God's chicken is Chick-fil-A, then the manna that the Israelites ate while they were wandering in the wilderness was Santita's chips. 
And they're great. They're $2.29 at Walmart. You should get them. And we get excited and we just talk about it. If I'm in public and I see somebody in a soccer jersey, I'm going up to them. I'm like, hey, tell me your favorite team. Do you want to get together and watch soccer? It's like this little club. When we get pumped about something, we cannot stop talking about it. It is just a part of our nature. And here's why. Because we feel like the other person's life would be better if they had it. I've never met a person in my life who I think their life would be worse without Santinas. I really think your life would be better. Essential oil people really believe that your life would be better. And listen, I mean, I, I don't know if it works. I, it smells nice and I like that. CrossFit people talk about CrossFit so much and it's fun to make fun of them because they talk about it all the time, but they talk about it because deep down in their spirit, they believe everyone's life would be better if they did something like CrossFit and you got healthier. And honestly, they're probably not wrong. When we find something good, we want other people to have the good thing that we found. What if for many of us, we have found the greatest good we have found the single most important thing imaginable, the greatest gift ever given. What if so many of us have it and yet we're so much more likely to talk about anything else other than that single great gift? If you're sitting in North or South or you're joining us online this morning and you would say that you're a Jesus follower, you found the greatest gift. And it's not close. Everything pales in comparison to the gift of Jesus. Because if you're a Jesus follower, what it means is that you believe that years ago, there was these two people, Adam and Eve, and they got to walk with God and be in his presence. I mean, God created Adam out of dirt. God fashioned Eve out of one of Adam's ribs. God created them and then God walked with them and he talked with them. And they were in this intimate relationship. And then one day, Adam and Eve decide that they're going to do what they want to do instead of what God wanted them to do. And that is called sin. If you want a foundational explanation of sin, it's just every time I choose my way over his way. And they sinned. And that moment, the world broke. And all of a sudden, there was difficulty. There was striving. There was pain. There was suffering. There was death. For the first time in humanity, there was that. Romans describes it to us like this. For the wages of sin is death. This right here, that one word was every single person's destiny. Death. And I know that's like a super weight. I mean, just a mere seconds ago, we were talking about CrossFit and now we're talking about this. I get that it's heavy. But this was my destiny, y'all. My destiny was death. No hope, pain, suffering, death forever. Think of the weight of that. Heavy or not, it was your destiny too. But thankfully, Romans 6 didn't end there because the Father loved you enough that he sent Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yes, the cost, the weight of sin was death, but Jesus, Jesus came to save the lost. Jesus came to pay that cost of death for you and me. That is the free gift of God in the person of Jesus. Finding Jesus is the single greatest gift we could ever receive. I don't know what happened with that. <laughs> that was a good point. So was, the lights were telling you to pay attention to it. Finding God is the, finding Jesus is the single greatest gift we could ever receive. Because it is in Jesus that I move from lost to found. It is in Jesus that I move from hopeless to somebody that can have hope. A slave to free an orphan to a son, all in Jesus. I mean, that's, I could be done preaching right now and we could move on. That's the whole gospel. That is, that is everything. But if we find something that good, the greatest good, we can't keep it to ourselves because we have a world that desperately needs the hope found only in Jesus. 
Turn, turn on the news for 6.2 seconds and look at the world. And you tell me if we have a world that is just going fine. Tell me if we look out in the world and we think things are great, hunky-dory, everything's good. No, we look at our world and we go, what a dark, ugly world. And we have two options. We can bury our head in the sand and say to hell with all of them. Or we can figure out the reality of what is offered to every single one of them in the person of Jesus. This gift, this hope, because their destiny is to hell. And we have the alternative. We found it. We know the hope found in Jesus. We know the peace that is offered instead of chaos. We know joy instead of suffering. Like that is what our world needs. How selfish would we be to keep it to ourselves? The single greatest thing, and it's easier to talk about chips than it is to talk about Jesus. It's the greatest gift imaginable. And when we receive something that good, that beautiful, that important, that eternity altering, we got to give it away. Last week, Pastor David talked about how we are more blessed when we give than when we receive. This is the greatest thing we've ever received. How much should we then share it? Charles Spurgeon, the great theologian, said it like this. If you understand what Jesus has done for you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering it into your child's ear. You'll be telling it to your husband. You'll be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. That's what I want. I want my eyes to flash as I talk about the love of my Savior. I want to be grabbing everyone that I can and telling them the beauty of Jesus and the love of the Father. And that's the call on each of our lives. Found people are supposed to find people. If you've been found, the call on our life is to be somebody that finds people. And we see that in the book of Acts. So if you will, if you'll grab a Bible, we're going to open it up to Acts 1. We're going to be, so this, let me catch you up in the narrative of scripture. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one around you. Uh, If you're at our online campus, which we know it's cold outside and there's a lot of people that are, there's a Bible icon right there on the screen. Acts 1 verse 4 is where we're going to be. But where we're at in kind of the arc of scripture, we're in the New Testament. So we've gone through all the Old Testament stuff. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospels. They talk about the stories of Jesus and his love and his ministry and his calling of the disciples. And then it talks about his death and his burial and his resurrection. And then we get to Acts 1, the Acts of the Apostles. And it's talking about the beginnings of the early church, how things are going to look. He grabs, and where we're at in our text, he's grabs some men and women that are going to be the forerunners in the church that are going to set everything in motion. And he tells them this. He says, while staying with them, he ordered them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. For a second, I want us to think about the disciples, the apostles, like this group of people that he's talking to. Just a few years before this, they're just living their life. They're fishing, they're collecting taxes, they're just living their life. And then a man walks up to them and says, hey, leave everything and then follow me. And they go, okay. And they leave their families and their jobs. They leave everything and they follow Jesus. And they listen to him teach. They see him start doing the miraculous. They watch this man walk on water. They see him spit in the dirt and make a mud pie and put it in a guy's eye and heal this man's eye. They see him attach an ear that's been cut off. They see him raise the dead. They see Jesus do stuff. And then they see Jesus betrayed. They see him strapped to a pole where he then gets whipped with a whip that's made to tear chunks of flesh out of the body and chunks of his back gets taken out and probably his sides as the whip wrapped around it. Then they watch a crown of thorns shoved onto his head. And then they watch him go to the cross and 
die a brutal death. Because on the cross, it's not the blood loss that kills you. It is you suffocate. You push your feet up. There's a nail that goes through both feet and you would push your foot up just to try to take a breath. And the whole time you're struggling to breathe. I mean, it is brutal. And then they watch him die. And can you imagine that time period from death, Jesus' death and his burial and the resurrection? You imagine how despondent these guys felt. This men and women of the early church felt. Just, how is their savior? And then he's raised. And he appears to them. And he starts talking to them. And he begins to teach them again. And he's talking to them about like when he goes away again. And, but, but their focus is, they're like, Jesus, all right. We watched you do all the stuff. We saw you do all the miracles. We heard you talk about how you're going to set up your kingdom that in you's life. We've seen you do all that. Now, now surely it is time for you to set up your kingdom. Surely now, after all that you've done, it is now time for you to rule. Surely. And Jesus goes, hey, it's not. We're not going to, that's not the focus right now. Our focus is not me setting up my kingdom. Your focus actually is not even solely following me anymore. Now your focus is to go out into the world and tell them about me. Your focus is shifting from just following me from place to place. And now you have this responsibility to go into the areas close to you and then a little further to the very ends of the earth because these people don't know me. They don't know the hope that's found in me. They don't know that there is a father in heaven who loves them so much and wants life for them. They don't know that in me is life and life abundance. They don't know. You got to go tell them. You go be my witnesses. And we read this and we know how the story continues to go. And it feels so good. Like we're so glad that the disciples did it. That they went out into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, into the ends of the earth. We are all here because one of those people did what they were supposed to do in Acts 1. It's incredible. And they wrote letters to each other, and they wrote letters to churches, and that became the New Testament canon. Like, it's, we're so glad they did it. But that call in Acts 1 did not cease with the apostles. We are all called to be Jesus' witnesses to the world around us. Found people find people. This call, this responsibility that Jesus gives to them didn't end with them. It also continues to us. And over and over again, he said this word, will. He said, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will go into all the world. This was not something, a responsibility that we could pass off to somebody else. There are some things in the church world that not everyone should do. Best example I can give you. I feel so tremendously blessed that we have worship teams and worship leaders like we do. The anointing on Mason and on Lucas and on Ashley and all the people that lead us. I mean, it's incredible. We are so blessed. And there are so many of you that should never try to be a worship leader. I walk around and you know who else shouldn't? This guy. That's a responsibility somebody else can do. We've got an incredible student ministry, God doing awesome things in there. Not every person should be a seventh grade boy's life group leader. You shouldn't. It takes a special person. And I love student ministry, it's incredible. But not everyone needs to do that role. Not every person needs to have a business and grow that business and walk in a radical gift of generosity. That's not everyone's responsibility, it is some people's. Now we're all called to worship. We're all called to serve. We're all called to give. But how that's walked out is different for each and every person. But this one, he said, you will. <laughs> you will be my witness into the world around you. You will go into the Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. You will go into the Abilene, into the big country, into Texas, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witness to a world that needs it. If you want a confession, it's so hard sometimes to do that. I, I've been a follower of Jesus since I was eight. I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor. I've been on staff at Beltway 17 years. I still often find this hard. There are still lots of times I'll be sitting at the restaurant or at the grocery store, or at the coffee shop, and I'll feel like God goes, hey, just, you need to talk to that person. And I'll be like, 
But God, they're going to think I'm weird. I don't want to be looked at as the weird guy who's going up to random people going, hey, I feel like God told me to talk to you. And often walking out the call of Acts 1, being a found person who finds people, is going to make us feel weird or uncomfortable or maybe even a little embarrassed. If I tell people that they need Jesus, there are going to be times that that doesn't necessarily go the way that I want it to. There are going to be times that you might lose a friendship. There are going to be times that you might feel like you look a little silly. Here's my question. If you love the people you're around, forget even love. If you kind of like the people that you're around and you have the greatest gift imaginable, isn't it worth being a little uncomfortable? Isn't it worth maybe looking silly? Isn't it, isn't it worth potentially losing a friendship so that they find life instead of death? So they find heaven instead of hell? So they find abundance instead of poverty? Isn't it worth it? For them to move from an orphan to a son and daughter of the most, isn't it worth it? One of the best analogies I ever heard from this, Pastor David gave years ago, and um, it is. So let's say... Let's say you have a friend. She's a girl and she gets engaged, all right? And she's engaged just, first, I got stuck on the same word that I did. First service, I said, she's engaged to a hunk. And that's a really weird word to say from stage. But she's engaged to like a hunk, like a really great looking fella, real talented. He's got a great job. He gets paid good. He, he says he loves her. He says he loves Jesus. He goes to church with her. He treats her great. He still calls his mom. She's, she's engaged to like a great guy. And then one day, he, she goes out of town. And you've never seen your friend this happy. Maybe she's going to a bachelorette party. She's going to do something fun. She's just so full of life. She's so full of joy. She's got to the point that on Facebook or Instagram, you're thinking about unfollowing her because she's insufferably happy. And then she leaves and you're at a restaurant and this guy walks in with a girl. And you think, oh, maybe it's a sister, it could be a friend, whatever. And then they start making out and you're like, I hope it's not sister. <laughs> Are you gonna tell her? Before you answer, remember she's never been this happy. You've never seen her with this much joy. And you telling her that this guy that she thought was the perfect guy is cheating on her. You know it's going to crush her. She's going to be so sad. She may not even believe you. She may think you're just being jealous. It might be the end of your friendship. You can tell her? Of course we're going to tell her. Yeah, we're, we're going to tell her because we care about her. Because we want her to know as she's going, she's committing to love this guy for the rest of her life. We want her to at least know all the facts about the case. Of course we're going to tell her. How much more does that situation pale in comparison to somebody's eternal destiny? I mean, that's one, that's just a dating, they're engaged at this point. They're not even married. They can break it off without any big consequences. We're talking about people's eternity. How much more should we feel the weight and the burden to be one of those people who's a found person who finds people? Jesus says, be the friend that tells them. So what does that look like? This week, as I was getting ready to preach and thinking about where we were going, um, I did have this burden of, I, I recognize in a room this big in the North Campus and however many people are watching online, I recognize that there's actually probably a lot of people who wouldn't even say they're a found person, so forget finding people. And I would be remiss in a sermon like this if I didn't at least talk to you. So if you're a person who's never found Jesus, give me two minutes. First of all, I'm glad you're here. I'm thankful that you've felt comfortable to come to church, even if somebody forced you to go. I hope you feel welcomed and loved because you are. And I want you to know that God Almighty loves you, you individually, more than you can fathom. He loved you enough that when our life posture was just a middle finger to God, that he still sent his son. When we were sinning, doing what we wanted, not caring about him at all, he still loved you enough that he would send Jesus. 
for you to die that death that I'm ta- I talked about earlier, to pay that cost for the wages of sin is death. He loved you enough that he would send his son so you could have life. And according to his own words, life abundant. If you've never been found, stop playing hide and seek. <laughs> he loves you more than you can imagine. And he has a hope and a destiny for you that is so much greater than anything we would settle for. Be found. And if you're somebody that is found, you would say you're a Jesus follower. You're around people a lot who have not been. And I know it's easy. We live in the big country, so it's easy to think just everybody is a Christian. Everybody follows God. Just because everybody says they're a Christian doesn't mean that's actually the case. But even if, even if it was, you look at just the statistics in our region, in the big country area, there's about 130,000 people. On any given weekend, if we are generous with every number, on any given weekend, maybe 30,000 people attend church. Now, church attendance does not equal being a Christian. Jesus is what saves us. But Often the overflow of finding Jesus is being with his people. That means there's about 100,000 people in the big country who aren't attending church. Maybe tens of thousands of those aren't following Jesus at all. And we're around them constantly. We go to Target and we're around them. We go to Walmart, we're around them. United, but not the one on Buffalo Gap Road. And we're around them. That's my United, okay? It's just horrible to get there. We go to the gym, we're around them. The coffee shop, we're around them. We're around people that have not been found all of the time. So how do I become a found person that finds people? It begins, the primary place is what Jesus said in Acts 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We can be his witness to the world around us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that you have to figure out how to do on your own strength. That verse is such a relief to me. It's such a relief that I don't have to, in my own feeble Jeffrey strength, figure out how to talk to people about Jesus and be a witness to a world that needs it. I don't have to do it all on my own. He says that it begins with us being filled by the Holy Spirit, which happens when every person says yes to Jesus, but that relationship between us and the Holy Spirit can get way deeper than it is when we first become a Christian. It's supposed to get deeper. And we grow in relationship with him by reading his word, which is revealing his heart for us, by being with his people, by talking to him in prayer, by listening to him through prayer. We grow in relationship with him. We walk deeper in his strength. Think about the reality of what Jesus said there, that we have the Holy Spirit in our life. We carry the very embodiment of God himself into every place that we go. Think about that. I know it's easy if you come to church a lot, we talk about the Holy Spirit. That is crazy. When I go to the gym, I get to take God with me. Now, he's not making me a lot stronger. Some of that I gotta do on my own. That's some discipline stuff, but he's there with me. When I go to the grocery store later, he is with me. When I'm at home, he is with me. Everywhere you go, if you're a Jesus follower, you carry the embodiment of God Almighty. So do we have to figure it out on our own strength? No, you don't. You get to have the strength of the filling of God Almighty and then walk in it. And once we've done that and we're connected with him and we're diving into his word and we're praying and we feel like we're walking in his strength, then we just grab hold of a tool that we've talked about a lot around here, a tool that we call BLESS. And it's an acronym because we're Christians and we love a good acronym. It begins with this, begin with prayer. This week, for whatever reason, it tickled me that the very first place that I was gonna tell you to go be a witness and talk to people about God is actually not talking to anyone at all. Just pray for them. Pray for that coworker. Pray for that friend. Ask God to move in them. Ask for an open door. Just a constant dialogue with him. God, would you bless them? God, would you work in their marriages? God, would you give me a chance to talk to them? God, would you position me around them? You can do all those things without ever speaking to them. And a few years ago, I stumbled across a tool that's helped me be a person of prayer. It's a tool called Bless Every Home. So it's that uh, web address is at the bottom of your notes. It's also uh, on the QR code on the chair backs in front of you. You can scan it. They'll drop it online. But here's what Bless Every Home does. See, the, we all 
have a place that we live and there are people that live around us, they're called neighbors. That's a great place that we can begin praying for people. You go to Bless Every Home, you can sign up, you put your address, select Beltway as your church. There's tons of churches actually in the big country that are all partnering together this spring to use Bless Every Home to try to cover the big country in prayer. And when you do that, it'll tell you the names of the people around you. And as you're doing the thing that we're supposed to all be doing in the new year, getting fit and going on our walks, you can pray for them. God, would you bless John? God, would you help him find you? God, would you, would you walk with Amy? Would you give me a chance to talk to her about the Lord? God, thank you for Travis. And I just ask that you would bless him. And God, would you give me the grace to love him the way he needs to be loved? You can walk through your neighborhood and begin to pray for them by name. And it's a cool little tool. It gives you like prompts. You can get an email prompt. It'll tell you, pray for this many people every day. It's neat. But more than that, it gives us a practical way to begin praying for people around us. And prayer is powerful. Prayer moves things. Second thing is this, listen to them. So we've gone through the first two and you haven't actually had to talk to them about anything yet. Just hear their heart. What's going on in their life? That also gives you things to pray for, for the record. But then it's also just you telling them, communicating to them that they're valuable. When we will stop talking and listen, it always tells people that they matter to us. We love to talk. Listening opens doors. And then eat with them. Just grab coffee with them. I know technically that's drinking. Go to Sonic with them. (laughs) Invite them to your home for a meal. When we'll eat with somebody, in the, in the craziness that we live our world, the, the pace that we're going at, the go, 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 when we'll stop and we'll sit down with them at a coffee shop and we'll look at them and, be, and begin to just have a dialogue with them, it opens doors and that's all we're trying to do with when we're blessing our neighbors. We're just trying to open doors and we do another one by serving them. Rake their leaves. If you're close enough to them, pick up their kids from school. If the person you're trying to, the, your target person is somebody at the gym, bring them their favorite energy drink. If it's the Sonic lady, write her a note, put a gift card in there for a car wash and give it to her. Just find opportunities to serve. Scripture tells us that the son of man came to serve, not to be served. If serving was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And then we've done all four of these and have yet to really talk to them about Jesus. And we do that by sharing our story. We can make evangelism feel like this really difficult thing often, but really the easiest way to evangelize is just this. Tell people who I was before Jesus and who I am after Jesus. This was me before I met Jesus. This is my life after meeting Jesus. Here's the deal. If you're a Jesus follower, every single one of us are a Jesus follower because at some point, somebody decided to walk out Acts 1 and share their story with us. For me, it was my parents. For you, it may be a coworker or a friend, grandparent, but you're here following Jesus because at some point, somebody decided that your salvation was enough for them to tell you about Jesus. And as you share your story, guess what you can do at the end of that? Just invite them to church. We got lots of service options for them. Thursdays, Sundays at both campuses, online. The statistics on people coming to church because they were invited by a friend or relative are astonishing. 83% of people say they came to church for the first time solely because somebody invited them that they were close to. 83%. And not even people in the church, if you just poll the, poll the United, a poll that was done in the United States, eight out of 10 people say they would seriously consider going to church if just anyone that they were close to asked them. I mean, that is a crazy statistic. And here's what's beautiful. You're not responsible for them finding Jesus. You don't have to. Just like CrossFit people cannot make me do CrossFit. As much as Big Daddy David tries to make me do it, which is constantly, he tells me lots of things. And one of those is, hey, you should come do CrossFit with me. And I'm like, hey, no. (laughs) But even, even if he kept trying, Still not his responsibility if I do it or not. We're just called to be a witness. 
We're called to be a found person who finds people. And then we just trust that the Holy Spirit's going to do it. We just have to be the witness. We just got to walk in a way that we're going to bless our neighbors. But here's what's amazing. There is a profound ripple effect that happens when people begin to say yes to Jesus. So right now I'm going to invite Franz Hallgren up on stage with me. Franz is the other half. I won't say better half, but the other half of Jessica Hallgren, our women's pastor. But I want North Campus and online to be a part of this illustration. There's a ripple effect that happens with one yes. So, Abrianna, will you stand up? And then let's see who I'm going to pick on over here. Than, will you stand up? So let's say these two people in a room of hundreds, two people say yes to Jesus, which is awesome. Their destiny's changed. They went from lost to found. They went from orphan to son and daughter. They went from slave to free, hopeless to hope. These two. And then they get pumped up about it and they get excited because, and they start to share it because that's what we do when we get excited about things. And so just the people close to them find Jesus. So if you're standing relative, this is going to require, before we go on, this is going to require audience participation, okay? It only works if you participate. If you're close to one of them, will you stand up? Like within arm's reach, just within arm's reach. Okay. So we went from two to 15 in a second. They got excited about it. They started talking about it and telling people about the goodness of their Savior, about how amazing Jesus is, about hope, about life, about salvation. And they just told people about it. And then look, we went from two to 15. All destinies changed. Eternal differences, generational differences. But what's crazy about the ripple effect of getting excited about what God does is it just continues. So now if you're around anyone else that's standing, will you also stand? And as people around you stand, Stand up. So it's gonna, you're gonna have to stand as people around you stand. You're gonna have to pay attention, middle sections. <laughs> and all, all of a sudden, we go from just two to 15 to hundreds of people that got excited about their salvation in just a moment because we got excited about pointing people to Jesus. All right, so everybody sit down. And here's what's incredible. We will never know the full domino effect that happens with one yes. We will never know the generations that are different because one person said yes to Jesus. Each of those people that stand, that stood, each of them has families and they got coworkers. And you might play a part in somebody finding Jesus 200 years from now in a different continent because we cannot fathom the profound ripple effect that happens with somebody saying yes. It changes generations. It changes eternities. We will never know. We're going to get to heaven and there will be people that were there because we were a found person who chose to find people. And we just put people in a position for the Holy Spirit to move on their heart. That's the responsibility of Acts 1. That's the call. Be a found person who finds people. Will you bow your heads? Let me give us just a moment to respond. If you're one of those people who has not been found, I'm gonna just ask you for boldness this morning. Just for you. Boldness to where you're at. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I want the hope found in you. I lay my sin at your feet. For those of us who would say we are found people, would we feel both the weight and the joy of getting to go into our neighborhoods today and into our jobs tomorrow, into the coffee shop on Wednesday? Would we feel the joy, but also the responsibility to go be the person who tries to find people and tell them about Jesus? Tell them about our Savior. Tell them about the love of the Father that so 
unfathomably great. The grace and abundance. Would we feel a weight and a boldness to do that? God, we thank you. Thank you first and foremost for Jesus. God, would you, wherever we're at, however we need to respond, would our hearts be a yes? It's in your name we pray. Amen.